now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult the propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Just about a month ago, as you hear this, a young man walked into a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, and opened fire, leaving 22 people dead, 24 wounded. And I wonder whether we've actually placed the blame where it belongs. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Uh, Joining me tonight is uh, a gentleman who researches... Well, the the principalities and powers that the Apostle Paul told us we truly contend with, not the human opponents. Certainly, young Patrick Cruzius, the accused shooter in the uh, attack in El Paso, uh, bears responsibility. But again, there are principalities, powers, cosmic rulers over this present darkness behind him. And certainly the mainstream media is not going to assign any of the blame there. Our guest is a retired private investigator with more than 20 years' experience in training law enforcement on occult crimes and crimes against children, is the author of 11 books, and uh, in- including the recently released War of the Ages, a complete scriptural guide to confronting and defeating Satan's kingdom. We first met at the Sons of God, Giants of Old Conference in Lubbock, Texas last year, saw him again this year, and discussed this program while we were there. And so it is our honor to welcome back to A View from the Bunker, Dr. Gregory Reed. Greg, welcome. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be back on with you. This this had to be a real shock for a community like El Paso uh, for something like this to happen and, and see so many dozens of people killed and wounded in a single yeah. event. And the shooter, um, apprehended by police, had driven all the way from Dallas, the, the Dallas area, Allen, Texas, from, da- from Dallas to El Paso, specifically, in his words, to kill Mexicans. Um, so you've got multiple levels to this crime. I would argue that anyone who tries to take the life or injure someone else is committing a hate crime. But when it's based on the, the color of someone's skin or their ethnicity, um, it, it's even more abhorrent. What was the reaction like in El Paso? And then specifically, how did the churches in El Paso address this issue? Well, it was uh, obviously horrendous shock. Uh, grief immediately set in uh, in many ways. We're, we're different here in El Paso from a lot of different cities. I'm not originally from here. But when something happens like this, everybody comes together and does everything they can to help out the families and the loved ones. This is kind of an unusual town, maybe three quarters of a million people, I think. But it's like everybody knows somebody and you run into people all the time. So everybody I know practically was touched in some way or had a friend who was touched by this or a a relative. And uh, so in that close knit community, it's there was, like I said, a lot of grief. I'm very proud of the way the churches uh, came together. The uh, church that I youth pastored for uh, seven years, they uh, immediately got the church together and had baked goods and thank you notes that they took down to the hospital for the police officers and for the the hospital workers. It was, it was really touching to see all of that. Hmm. I should mention that uh, Dr. Reed has been in youth ministry for more than 40 years. His ministry is youth fire ministries online at Gregory com, And that'll be in the show notes. You can find the link there. Um, How did, how did kids respond to this, Greg? Uh, Is this, uh, is this something that you addressed with the, with, with any uh, students or, or kids, I mean, how, how do they cope with something like this? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I was actually out of town when it happened. And I immediately thought, I need to be home because I, I have a Monday night meeting with a lot of the, the young people uh, that I still minister to. And I just thought, I need to be home. I need to be home for me. I need to be home for them. And we had more... It was no, I mean, it's not a big group, but we had a house full. I, I ran out of chairs because they, um, every, everybody wants to know why uh, they feel lost. Uh, I mean, my uh, group are very much spiritual warriors, so they just kind of wanted to make sure they were on the right footing, and it was uh, it was hard for them, and um, really, really, 
they really stepped up to the plate in terms of prayer and just saying, look, we've got a job to do as believers. And that is, we don't have to explain this because, you know, that's that happens at a course of time. We are required to be there for those that are grieving. And a lot of them had friends who were touched by this. So um, I'm glad I came home early. And we've ever since have been just kind of working. They've been working to reach out to their friends because their generation is more troubled, I think, than any generation in history and they know it and they're they are praying how do we reach them because the level of despair and i hesitate to even say this but we had a not in our particular group but there was a young man who had uh taken his life just a week before that Hmm. uh, that several of my uh, young people knew and so it's almost becoming an epidemic and so my concerns have only grown steadily as i realized first of all the war is real and it is not against flesh and blood. It's against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness is my places. Secondly, that these things can inhabit people and do horrible things. That doesn't, as you say, take away from the personal responsibility. But something triggers something and something takes over and something like this happens. And we heard plenty of reports of, of different conflicts there within even who witnessed this thing. But the third thing is just that we've really are failing in the one area we need to be working on the most as generally in the Western churches with youth. There's never been a time when they need to be trained, they need to be ready, they need to be discipled, and I'm afraid most of what I'm seeing is just more games and more fun. Hmm. You use the word inhabit, and I just want to be very clear here because uh, research by the Barna Group into what Americans believe, what American Christians believe, shows that most American Christians don't really believe that the enemy is real. They About 60% of American Christians uh, agree that Satan is not a literal entity, but just a a concept, a, a, a symbol that represents the evil inside our own hearts. So if they don't believe Satan is real, they're not likely to believe that demons are real, that fallen angels are real. Um, we're just doing war against the evil inside ourselves. When you say something can inhabit somebody, you're not talking about a concept or philosophy or just a, a, a bad idea. No, absolutely not. And I know there's a lot of different factors, including to some degree programming that may go on in some situations, but I'm talking about a real uh, literal uh, demon that has been around for, you know, thousands of years, uh, continues to want to inhabit human bodies. And it's, it's sad because there's never been a time when we need to, as a church to be more aware of how to pray, how to put the armor on, and how to fight against this. And as you, as I talked about in the conference, we're going to see more and more manifestations like this, and most believers are not uh, equipped to deal with it all they, they should be. It's very simple on how to deal with those things. But the thing that's very difficult with all this is, is that they're just dismissing it as, well, I don't really believe in Satan or demons. And I think uh, probably A.W. Tozer said it best. I believe it was him. He says, I know Satan is real because I've done business with him. Hmm. And when, when you've done business with darkness, as, as I have over the years, I almost want to laugh when I hear a Christian say, I don't believe in this stuff. I'm like, well, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> it's... Uh- yeah, because it's it's in the Bible. Uh, it, it's amazing how many Christians want to use it as sort of a uh, like a theological buffet. Well, I don't like that item, so I'm going to leave that there on the page and just pretend it's not there. I'll just take this part that I like that's encouraging and sounds cheerful. We'll skip over Revelation because that's creepy and weird, uh, and all the demonic stuff that you know Jesus and the apostles casting out demons. That all ended when we discovered the science of psychiatry and psychology. Uh, yes. The, we cannot know what was in the heart of, of Patrick Cruzius, the young man who was apprehended by police after the, the shootings. But there are witnesses who said that it appeared that he was dancing as he was walking through the aisles and, and shooting people. Um, what do you make of that, if, if, that, if those are, accounts are accurate? I uh, it, My first reaction was when I heard that, that is only somebody that has been fully demonized would be doing that. And there were other reports, unverified that as soon as it was over and he was under arrest, he was so disoriented and confused. And that's what happens when these things vacate a person. Hmm. Uh, We have to be very careful when we do what I call extractions because 
there's some levels and it comes out very quickly and other times a person can really be uh, very severely uh, traumatized by that extraction and so we're, we're always extraordinarily careful about this but part of what makes it difficult is that as you know if you change the vocabulary of a society then you can change the meaning of truth yes for a society and one of the things that they have changed the vocabulary on is demons and you hear this in Hollywood all the time well I need to deal with my own personal demons I'm like you don't even know what you're talking about hmm. to them that is a psychological thing it's just a cute thing yeah well I dealt with my demons they've changed the language to downplay the seriousness of what's really there, which is really fine for the enemy. I'm, I know you've been around long enough, like me, to remember Keith Green, who had the brilliant song, uh, No One Believes in Him Anymore, where Satan is basically saying, my job keeps getting easier as day turns into day, because nobody believes in me anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the line that uh, was written by Baudelaire in the 19th century that was uh, adapted for the film The Usual Suspects, The Greatest Trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. Absolutely. Yeah. And in the, in the real world of occultism, uh, when you get to a certain level, that's also it. As a matter of fact, their, uh, their motto is the guarantee of our tomorrow is today's perception that we do not exist. Hmm. You, you made a really good observation at the uh, conference in Lubbock last weekend, and uh, you included a reference to this in your most recent newsletter, uh, which uh, we received just a couple of days ago. Um, Hollywood, after the shootings in El Paso and Dayton, same weekend, the previous weekend, the Garlic Festival out there in California, uh, condemning guns and gun ownership. Um, now, here in the Ozarks, we live far enough away from town that if something were to happen, police wouldn't have enough time to get to us before uh, the situation would already be you know, beyond saving. So uh, we, we do have weapons at home for our own protection. Uh, we're also sure. far enough out in the country that we occasionally got to deal with critters that uh, might we might not want getting too close to the house. Haven't right. had to, haven't had to scare any away just yet. Uh, I hope I don't, but uh, we've got the, the the means to do so. Um, but you point out in your newsletter that Hollywood is the ultimate hypocrite, the body of Babylon producing demonic babies on celluloid that warp and numb and infect, yet they blame gun violence. And then you shared with the uh, in your newsletter and at uh, Lubbock, your reaction to some recent films that you saw, um, what, what kind of disconnect is there in, in Hollywood that they would turn and blame guns and then w while at the same time they're putting out these these violent movies that are, are basically training up our children to believe that that's normal? Well, I think it is very much obviously indicative of the last days that we're living in, that in the last days that people, it says that because of the, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I think what's happening as a whole, of course, Hollywood's pretty much all, it's, it's never been quite as bad, but they, they're so disconnected from reality that they can have their own bodyguards that are armed and then go out the same day and talk about gun violence and how everybody needs to get their guns taken away. <laughs> and, and that's just part of the great delusion. You know, we know in the last days there's going to be a great falling away, but also a great massive delusion. And as the scriptures say, that the truth will become um, a lie, and the lie will become a truth, good will become evil, and evil will become good. And we are living that out, and Hollywood is exemplifies it. I mean, the same week that uh, the shootings happened, they just had released the movie, latest uh, Tarantino movie. It was horribly violent. Uh, and I guess, and I heard people laughing through the whole movie hmm. during the violent part. And I thought, what is the matter with people? But, you know, it's a different thing uh, when it's our town, when it's uh, our city, when it's our Walmart, and people are faced with the fact that this is not a game, that video games, people die, and there's no consequences. But in real life, there is a level of violence that's coming on the world that's unprecedented. And it's got nothing to do with guns. It's got to do with a fulfillment of what Jesus said in Matthew 24, when he said, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And in the days of Noah, as you know, in Genesis 6, it says violence covered the face of the earth. And here we are. Hmm. 
We're talking with Dr. Gregory Reed of Youth Fire Ministries on a view from the bunker. The um, the shooting in El Paso, the shooting in in uh, you know Parkland, Florida, the the tragic shooting in Las Vegas at the the country music concert uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, the, these are things that that seem to flare up for a little while. The the debate rages about. Uh, guns, but then the, the conversation never really seems to turn to wh- wh- how are these these young men? Because most of the shooters are, are um, young men, typically young white men. Um, the, the conversation never seems to turn to how they were raised and, and the family uh, situation that they were in. Sometimes you'll, you'll see some mention of uh, well, they were on some sort of antidepressant that might have had something to. But again, the family situation never seems to be brought into the conversation. And when you start looking at that, you find a common thread there that most of them come from homes that were not nuclear families, not uh, you, you didn't have a, a stable, uh, loving home, mother, father, you know, uh, figure both in the home uh, for, for most of these uh, these shooters. Um, how does that contribute to the spiritual? Uh, the, the spiritual, uh, I don't know, milieu, I guess, or the spiritual soil in which these these evil seeds are planted? Well, I think it leaves, you know, a vacancy. Um, I mean, I know that it's in this day and age, having an intact family is the exception rather than the rule, mm-hmm. at least for you know a long period of time. And uh, I, I believe with all my heart, the kids need an intact family, mom and a dad, uh, at least a mom and a dad that are interactive, you know, with each other towards the child, if not with each other. Uh, and that is getting more and more rare. Kids are still, you know, we talked about latchkey kids uh, back in the day, but now it's worse because the parents, it's not that they're latchkey because their parents are at work. They're latchkey because their parents are uninvolved. And, you know, we, this whole uh, generation after generation of parents wanting to be their child's friend rather than a real parent. Yeah. It's all a matter of reaping what we've sowed over generations. Uh, but the, 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 what it's produced is a generation that feels hopeless, like there's no meaning, like there's no point. And it's it's tragic to see. And, of course, I know this is an ongoing investigation. They've just gotten started. I, I've actually asked the Lord if there's a way that maybe I can get in and talk to this young man. And I haven't uh, ruled out that they may happen at some point. I hope it can happen. Uh, because he needs Jesus, too. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's a horrible thing he did, and I don't discount that. But one of the first young people who I know had committed a triple homicide in Oklahoma, killed his mother and his stepfather and his store clerk. He came to Jesus after he was in jail. And f- for the rest of his life before he was executed, he led a lot of people to Jesus. Hmm. And I know people have a problem with that. But our, our first, you know, once we get past the horror... We also realize, you know, we need to start taking responsibility as a culture and as parents and as friends and all of that and look at this and say, what is the genesis of this? Where did this come from? What was astonishing to me is how the media immediately began to paint the boy as a conservative, the father as a Christian who had written a Christian testimony. Mm -hmm. Neither one which are true. The first initial, and I think I can say this, information I got that this kid was also, he was kind of involved in, at least attracted to, eco-terrorism. Right, right. And the other point is that his mother and father, I don't know them, but his father was certainly not a Christian. He was a New Age uh, energy healer. (laughs) Dealing with Reiki and stuff like that? Yes. Ah. And so that leaves an, an atmosphere of and, and, you know, Derek, this is one of the questions I get a lot. Well, how do you know if somebody's going to get demonized or not? The scary thing is, is you don't. It's Russian roulette when you play with the occult. It's Russian roulette spiritually when you play with uh, New Age activities. Mm-hmm. It, it may not harm you greatly. Spiritually it will. Eternally it will. But other people, it just opens a door for these other things to come in and influence and sometimes inhabit and sometimes do horrible things. I'm fairly convinced something of that nature happened to that young man, but I can't know it for certain. Mm. The uh, shooter in Parkland, uh, the Parkland, uh, uh, Florida case that was uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, uh, Nicholas Cruz. About a year ago, investigators released the transcript of the the uh, 
interrogation uh, with uh, the young man, and he said that uh, the night before the shooting, uh, a demon came to him and told him to go ahead and do it. He admitted to hearing from demons. Um, I remember this the story when it came out and, and took note of it, but the way it was portrayed in the media was like, well, this kid's obviously crazy. Um, how often is that the case when we see instances like this, where even the when the 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 perpetrator of the crime says, "I was listening to voices." In, in Cruz's case, he actually said it was a demon. How often do, do is this actually taken seriously, or or does the media have a certain slant that they uh, apply to uh, reporting stories like this? It's not taken seriously. It's like you say, it's like, well, the kid's crazy, or. And if you notice something, all the shooters, and this is a pattern, and I think there's something bigger going on without, you know, going way out on, on the conspiracy limb. But one of the things that I've noticed about a lot of the shooters, uh, besides the same profile, the same, a lot of them the same age, the same look in the eyes, they go to court very quickly. They're declared legally insane. And then you'll never hear from them again. That's like they disappear off the face of the earth. Uh, And I know there's a reason for it. I just haven't gotten to it yet. But I think, you know, more often than not in these crimes, I've heard something of that nature where they're talking about where they had been, you know, practicing certain, you know, dark uh, cultic things or, uh, you know, that they had heard that the devil had the one I was talking about, Sean Sellers, Mm -hmm. you know, he almost got a direct command to go and do what he did from these voices or this voice. Now, I'm very careful on this because I know that schizophrenia can mimic demon possession and vice versa. But, and so I, you know, I think in in some ways uh, we need to be more careful with that. But uh, I, I think it's more often than not, I find that people that commit crimes like that have been touched by the dark side or have deliberately engaged in it. Hmm. But even when there are elements of the the occult that show up in cases, and they're not all cases that involve young men like this. I'm thinking in terms of the uh, the Toledo, um, uh, Ohio incident where a Roman Catholic priest was convicted of uh, stabbing a nun to death in the, uh, the the chapel of a of a hospital. And I'm forgetting his name, so I'm not going to try to recall it and get it wrong. Um, but uh, it was pretty clear it, when when testimony came out from from victims of the child sexual abuse that they had uh, they had suffered at the hands of this particular priest and and some of his fellows that there was some occult uh, work going on um uh, in in what was being done we're talking satanic ritual abuse uh, the the uh, Chapitulis uh, Hosanna Church in Chapitulis Parish in Louisiana is another case from about uh, 10 or 12, 15 years ago where the uh, elements of occult rituals were were found inside this church uh, the i mean it's it's creepy enough that the youth group room had windows that had been painted black to keep out the sunlight but they also found uh, robes and and sigils on the walls and floors and so forth and that stuff was very quickly covered up and the prosecutors decided not to even bring it into the courtroom um wh- why would law enforcement shy away from those aspects, in fact, if I remember correctly, by the way, that Hosanna Church case inspired the first season of uh, True Detective on HBO. Uh, wow. w- why would law enforcement try to shy, w- would shy away from th- these elements of these cases, when even when they've got physical evidence in their hands? There's two reasons. One is because of the court systems. Uh, prosecutors figured out from the early, I don't like this, but this is the way the reality we had to deal with is that if you threw the occult element in that, you would almost automatically lose the case because the defense attorneys had figured out a way to make this about religious persecution, (laughs) about hocus pocus, that this stuff doesn't really exist. And so the prosecutors figured out, I'm thinking of one particular case in Oklahoma where it was clearly uh, a a guy who was deeply, deeply involved in the occult, murdered his girlfriend and his his baby. Uh, Oh, wow. And he was deep, deep into this. And I worked with the detective that was on that case, and and they had they figured out with the prosecutors we can't bring any of that in, or we will lose. So they just have sometimes they have to just prosecute on the bare evidence. And I finally had to come to a place where, look, I don't care what this guy worshipped, even it was a cookie monster or something. 
I just want to see him in jail for the rest of his life. So however you can make that happen, if you have to leave the occult out, that's fine. However, occult involvement goes to motive. And that is where they lose it a lot of times because if motive matters in these things. And I told law enforcement when I was training them, I said, if you get one guy when you could have, could have gotten 10, wouldn't it be better to realize you need to find out the motive? You need to spread the net a little farther and, and find out if there's anybody else involved? Because that was often the case. So very rarely these real serious ones operated completely independently. But the second reason, uh, Derek, this happened is that when when you deal with these kinds of crimes, you talked about Ponchatoula, Louisiana. When that broke, we moved heaven and earth to reach the chief of police. I sent him information. I said, whatever you do, try to not make this federal. Read the information first. Get your ducks in a row before you bring in anybody except the locals. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't last long. I'm not sure where the, the thread got dropped, but, uh, and I uh, hope I'm not, I don't, uh, hope I don't get any trouble for this, but they basically brought a guy out of cold storage uh, from one of those three letter agencies who had been a nemesis to us for years for oh. trying to say this stuff doesn't exist. He was actually retired. And they took him out of cold storage and brought him down there. And from my understanding, he just blew a gasket and said, you're not bringing any of this cult stuff into this. And I'm a, we're taking everything. End of case. Now, why he did that? That's uh, one of those great mysteries of life. But it's enough to tell me there's sometimes bigger hands at work in all of this. Hmm. That, that was hinted at in the uh, third season of, of True Detective, which, by the way, is not a show I would recommend most Christians watch. There's a lot of uh, violence, profanity, some some sexual situations that you don't want to get into. I watch it just to see how that information is is portrayed and, and put out there to uh, secular viewers, the mainstream viewers. Um, by the way, that the Roman Catholic priest I was trying to think of was Gerald Robinson was his name in uh, the right. Toledo yeah. case, Father Gerald Robinson. Um, and they, they hinted at something, some sort of uh, deeper conspiracy that was was uh in, in a case that was seemed similar disappearance of two children uh, uh in, in the third season but then they they the, the final episode they wrapped it up and and just kind of went in a totally different direction it, it had nothing to do with with uh, a cult or child abuse or anything like this it was just all a great big misunderstanding and like okay uh, maybe a way for Hollywood to try to put this information out there and then diffuse the idea, the so-called conspiracy theories, that there's some hidden hand at work, perhaps as in the Jeffrey Epstein case. Exactly. Um, and that's, what, that's when we realized that there are, and I knew, and I think I talked about this conference, so I've been following the Jeffrey Epstein thing for a couple of years when he almost got, I mean, he did get charged, but then he served a little, you know, he had to wear an ankle bracelet or something, served a little time. Yeah. When this really broke, I thought they're going to suicide him. That was what I told people. I said, mm -hmm. they're not going to let him live because he knows too much. For some reason, he's become a liability. But I also told people he's low hanging fruit. He is dispensable and they will do whatever they can. I mean, Derek, we've talked about this before, but Child trading and child pornography, what they call human trafficking now. Uh, even 10 years ago, I was told that it was a $35 billion a year industry. Mm -hmm. I can't even wrap my hand, my head around that. That's, that's a, you know, a gross national whatever of some small country. Right, right. So there's very little that they can't silence with that if they have a reason to. So... Hollywood proved out to be the useful idiot in all of this, and it's very typical for them to play something up and then say, ah, that's not what it was. Uh, when HBO, I think, did the special on the, uh, I think it was called Paradise Lost, on the murder of those poor little kids down in, uh, in, in Memphis. Oh, yes, and, the West Memphis Three. Yes, and, and nobody got the full truth on that, and no. probably never, nobody ever will except I had enough inside sources that I can say that that the whole series was uh, so far off. There were some truths in it, but the reality was 
is that somebody knew exactly what that was, and I will I will go to my grave saying that this was a ritual sacrifice. No, I agree. In fact, I've interviewed the author and researcher uh, William Ramsey about his book Abomination. Uh, Devil Worship and Deception in the West Memphis Three. In fact, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, If you've not heard that interview, you might want to go back and reference that because I read the book. William drew from the court transcripts. uh, So without inside sources, just drawing on the court transcripts, he makes, to my mind, an absolute rock-solid case that, uh, (laughs) that there was an occult signature to the crime and that, uh, well, uh, Damien Eccles is is now walking free, and he should be behind bars. Well, he played the system very well. Um, I actually had a friend who was doing prison ministry at the time, and he actually got in, and Eccles was able to convince him that he prayed to receive Jesus. Mm. And I told him, I said, actually, I wish that were true, but the fact is, is right now he's playing the Wiccan community to try and raise money for himself. Right, and right. And he did. And he's got some very powerful people in Hollywood, including uh, Peter Jackson and uh, Johnny, Depp. Johnny Depp, to uh, plead his case. And you're right; the the HBO special uh, made him made it look like a a a, a, a travesty of justice. Uh, and so he's, like I said, he's out walking free. He's in Salem, Massachusetts now. Last I heard, not surprisingly. Well, that's a good place for him. That's, right, right. That's great. Um, well, you know, one of the things that I keep coming back to in all of this, because, and, and I know there's probably some people listening and, you know, they're kind of blown away by all this. But one of the things, when we were really deep into this, I mean, we were going after everybody we could on a big level. And I had a friend of mine, and he just, we worked a little bit together, and he says, aren't you tired of just catching the little fish? And I said, yeah, you know what? But I learned something when I fished is that if you take away the little fish out there long enough, the big fish will come into shore. And I realized that, that our job, as much as we could do it, and you alluded to this a little bit, the level of sexual abuse of young men, particularly in this country, is through the roof. And that very easily translates either to either self-abuse, suicide a despair, and sometimes it does this other thing. So, you know, with what we do, our primary purpose is to throw the lifeline out there to as many of the kids who have been injured by this as we can, or just injured in general by things. And occasionally, we will we we pull somebody in that we're able to make a larger connection, and hopefully, eventually, some of these bigger fish are going to be held to account. Honestly, I don't hold out a lot of trust. A lot of hope that the Epstein thing is going to go any further because they work so closely, very quickly, to throw fairy dust on this. And mm-hmm. I told people, I said, we're not going to be talking about it six months ago. I mean, six months from now. Because we haven't talked about um, Harvey Weinstein for six months. Right, right. And that was the biggest thing out there. But that's how they work. We're, we're a victim, I think. Uh, I'm, I, forgive me if the author's right, wrong. You may be able to correct me. I think his name was Arthur Toynbee. Somebody wrote a book called Future Shock, and the premise was that we would come to a time where everything traumatic was happening so fast and scientific and social changes so fast that we'd be in a continual state of shock and we'd never be able to recover or think clearly about things until the next disaster. Mm. Uh, Future Shock was Alvin Toffler. Toffler. Yeah, Toffler. Uh, Toynbee was the guy whose name shows up on those weird Toynbee tiles that in the pavement all over the, which is a weird thing I hadn't thought about it in a long time. Um, but, but you're right this week we, we learned getting back to the Epstein case that, uh, we, and again, this was not really a surprise. The, the security camera that was focused on the entrance to his cell on the night leading up to the morning where he, he died. I won't say committed suicide, but the, the night before he died, apparently the video footage from that particular period of time according to the washington post this week is unusable now well, what does unusable mean um does it mean it, it was damaged it was destroyed somebody damaged the camera somebody pulled a plug what coincidence that the night before he died his cellmate was moved out even though eight eight officials in the jail knew that he was not to be left alone um the guards fell asleep that night, didn't check on him every 30 minutes as they were supposed to, and now they're not cooperating with investigators. And now we find out that the security camera that would tell us who entered his cell uh, 
it, it, the, the footage is unusable. And so we will not find out now why witnesses told reporters they heard shouting and shrieking the morning mm-hmm. that uh, Epstein died. So, yeah, I I don't think anybody was surprised. In fact, Jeffrey Epstein's death was probably a bigger surprise to Jeffrey Epstein than anybody who was really paying attention. I think so, because, you know, being, uh, and I hope he somehow found the Lord before he died, but uh, yes. being that he was as wealthy as he was and involved in so much nefarious activity as he was, he probably felt uh, somewhat untouchable. Uh, but you, you know the kinds of caliber of people that he enabled uh, in that dark world of child trading and child prostitution and all of that. Like I said, the stuff we learned about is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. But he was uh, arrogant enough to think it wasn't really going to touch him. And I think, uh, as uh, often people find out, that uh, nobody's untouchable by these things except those that are belong to Jesus Christ and are covered with his blood. Right. This is something that uh, kind of comes and goes in, in the mind of the public. I remember some years ago when Sharon and I first began this this journey, you know, through podcasting and, and writing about conspiracy theories. And at first, uh, you know, Sharon, I think, was is much wiser than I am. When I, we first started down this road, I thought, okay, well, this is really interesting, fascinating stuff. Let's unravel these conspiracies. Um, but now I, I've come to realize that this is really just, this is kind of where the spirit realm and, and the war taking place in in the in other dimensions beyond our perception kind of overlaps a little bit into our reality where we see children uh, who who are broken by th- this type of abuse uh, and it manifests in in horrible things like the the 22 dead 24 wounded in, in El Paso uh, the dead in Dayton the dead in uh, in California at Gilroy um, we Go back, you know, back to the 1980s with the, the Franklin Credit Union scandal and the Franklin cover-up. And I've interviewed the author of a book about the Franklin scandal. Interviewed uh, the late William H. Kennedy about uh, the pedophile priest, uh, Lucifer's Lodge, his book, and about the uh, the Johnny Gosh disappearance and alleged reappearance some years later. Um, the uh, the finders, the the group that uh, was arrested down in Tampa, if memory serves, and connected to some location in Washington, D.C., where Metro Police there investigated, found evidence of horrific abuse of children, only to be told by the United States government to stand down. Yes. Um, in fact, that showed up in the Epstein case. It was reported by a, uh, a journalist for Vanity, Vanity Fair that when the Trump administration interviewed uh, Alex uh, Acosta, the former U.S. attorney who cut the deal with uh, Epstein back in 2008, uh, they asked him about whether the plea deal would be a problem with the confirmation hearings. Obviously, it wasn't because he was approved. He was uh, uh, by the Senate as the uh, as the uh, Secretary of Labor until the Epstein case broke, and he had to resign to you know take one for the team. But Acosta told the Trump administration, according to this reporter, that he only met with Epstein's attorneys once and was told to get rid of the case, not to prosecute, because Epstein, quote, belonged to intelligence, end quote. Uh, Mm -hmm. No one in the mainstream media has followed up on that report. Who in intelligence are we talking about? Which intelligence at which country's intelligence agency? And what were they doing? What was Epstein doing with these children, these young girls, with these powerful men, at at whose behest? Um, If it's the United States, can we... (laughs) <laughs> has our government literally sold its soul to Satan? Well, I, I guess what I can say on that is that one of the things we learned early on is that the way these things work when it gets into the very, I guess, the deep state or the very, you know, the dark web type of real criminal activity, particularly when it comes to trafficking in children and some of the more deeper aspects of uh people who worship the devil or whatever is that it's just a simple thing for the right people in the right place to uh, somebody in the government. Let's just give an example of, you know, whoever Senator, whoever to be invited to a big, uh, you know, party after uh, some of the conventions and, you know, he gets uh, plastered enough to find himself in bed with an underage child Hmm. or teenager and, you know, he wakes up 
doesn't know what went on. But shortly after that, he's brought a packet of pictures that say, you're going to do exactly what we tell you to do, or these go public. And that's why a lot of the cases never got very far, because the minute we would get close, it would get shut down by people, sometimes in high places. And I thought, that's how they keep this thing silent. They blackmail people in powerful places who have got a lot of secrets that they don't want to come out. Hmm. <laughs> And the people laughed at Mike Pence when he said he didn't even want to be in a room with another woman without his wife present. Um, yeah. yeah, he's smart. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a wise policy for many reasons, but uh, there's some practical reasons, too. Um, you mentioned the word programming earlier, and I want to back up to that and uh, have you delve into that a little bit. Uh, programming, what aspect of uh, abuse of children would involve programming and programming to what end? You know, it's kind of a, a deep rabbit trail. Just briefly, mm-hmm. my friend Russ Dizdar has written a book on this um, called The Black Awakening, and I think he's much more uh, learned on this than I am. But there seems to have been a pattern since the uh, 50s and 60s of children who underwent ritual abuse or underwent abuse in uh, military settings, all of which they could not prove. Uh, although there was a lot of evidence that these things did, in fact, take place. And uh, a lot of them just, you find, like the shooter in Tucson or the shooter in Colorado. The shooter in Colorado uh, talked a lot about neuro-linguistic, that somebody had done something with them in the university with neuropathy or something, not neuropathy, but neuro-lingual, whatever. And he talked a lot about that, and then he didn't talk about it anymore. Of course, they shuffled him off. So I think there's a lot of people, if you look at a lot of these shooters, they have the same look. And it's a look that I can only say that I recognize as somebody that has been uh, programmed on a sophisticated level, a la Manchurian candidate, to do what they did. And I think there's some validity in that. I think I have seen that over the last 30 years. I've seen some evidence that that is a real program. And, of course, you get on the Internet and everybody goes crazy talking about Monarch program and talking about MKUltra and stuff. And it's all real, but all the stuff that's out there, or most of it, is a smokescreen to get people to look crazy. Hmm. And that seems to be the latest thing, whether it's the Jeffrey Epstein thing or anything else, is the media. I mean, I've even heard that they want to do some banning of certain programs and Facebook stuff because conspiracy theories are dangerous to the population. Well, that's just going to shut everybody up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a a gentleman that uh, recently passed away uh, named David McGowan. I interviewed years ago about his book, Programmed to Kill. And uh, there's a good section of it that's been excerpted. It's available online. I'm going to put a link to this in the show notes as well. Uh, The section that he titled The Pedophocracy. Uh, it's it's a little bit dated, but it gets to some of these cases that we had talked about uh, early on. The uh, Mark Dutroux case in in Brussels, uh, the the yes. Finders case, the the uh, oh what was the the preschool in uh, San Francisco, Mc um, McMartin McMartin no. Preschool, yes, yeah, Man Beach, right. So uh, I, I'll put a link there because for, for if, if this is new to you, listener, uh, this is something that we've been aware of for for some time, and of course. Uh, Greg has been dealing with this for for more than 40 years. This is something I come to late and, and praise God, don't have any uh, personal experience with, but I've done enough research into and talked to uh, enough people like Greg, like Russ Dizdar, uh, the, uh, you know, William H. Kennedy, uh, the, the author of the book on the, the Franklin scandal, um, that, that it is legitimate, it's real, and you're right. You can almost predict the way these stories are going to go when they do pop up in the public sphere they 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 are going to be a big splash very for a very short time and then suddenly it's going to disappear and i think you're right in 6 months uh many people will forget who jeffrey epstein even was um and we've reached a st- go ahead i'm sorry no no go ahead we've reached a stage now too where this is like i feel like somebody that's having to you know reinvent the wheel in some ways uh and fight the same battle we fought 30 years ago that has been that is back but 
the battlefield has changed in that in the period of time that we worked on that they rewrote the narrative who is they i'm not going to say because i don't know but those that have an interest in silencing the truth about these things have managed to completely rewrite the narrative of at least 25 years of work that we did and convinced almost everybody out there that this was all satanic panic mm, right and there was nothing to it and i just want to say unequivocally that is a lie, and I can say that because I was there. Hmm. And if, it's interesting that you mentioned that phrase, satanic panic, because I've just remembered a friend of mine sent me a link to a trailer for a forthcoming comedy horror film that is coming out probably around Halloween, if I well, may already be out. But anyway, a film called Satanic Panic, which again just mocks the whole idea that uh, elites are engaging in the type of activity that we're discussing. I mean, this, this again came to the public attention just a little bit, uh, during the, uh, aftermath of the 2016 election, as we, uh, saw some of the emails that came out from, uh, WikiLeaks from John Podesta's Gmail account, uh, Mm -hmm. talking about, uh, spirit cooking and the connection to, uh, Marina Abramovich and some of the very, very disturbing things that she's involved with. Uh, this this film, Satanic Panic, again, playing it as a comedy uh, to defuse any thought amongst the average person that this might actually be real, just as it was done years ago. And, you know, Geraldo Rivera, he just was so over the top. This is all just a joke. Um, it's, it's tragic the way this happens, especially when you've been on the receiving end of uh, this type of abuse. Um, the, I want to shift gears here for our final segment, Greg. There was something you brought up while we were in Lubbock that I, I found really intriguing because it's consistent with what I've heard from another researcher who is looking into the, the pagan community and what they believe. And, and this relates to reports that you're hearing that uh, something is shifting in the spirit realm. Yes, uh, I've gotten some uh, information from someone who's pretty tracks this stuff pretty carefully. That people within the both the pagan and the Wiccan community are reporting that they are opening up. And this is from them that they're doing what they usually do to or open up portals or you know to those things they want to call on to get what they want or whatever. But they're saying the word is coming back that they are frightened because what's coming back in is almost purely evil, and they're not able to control it anymore. So they think that they've opened some gateway to the spirit realm, and what's coming through is not what they expected, not what they hoped for, and they've got no way of stopping it. It's not benevolent, and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to to stop it. Hmm. Carl Teichrib, who's uh, written the book Game of Gods, does a lot of research visits, uh, gatherings. In fact, as we record this in late August, he's now at uh, the Burning Man Festival in the Black Rock Desert of Nevada, which is essentially just a giant magical working trying to fundamentally transform our reality. He reports that he hears from pagans that the gods, their gods are telling him that it's time to rebuild their temples. Now, the first time he said that to me, I kind of laughed because he had just attended a conference at uh, a Holiday Inn in Minneapolis or something. And so I just kind of laughed thinking, okay, so I guess they're tired of meeting in the uh, hospitality room at the, the, the Holiday Inn. But it's, it's really darker than that. And uh, I'm kind of ashamed that I, I actually laughed when, when I first heard this. Because this seems like, to me, yeah, obviously the, the Wiccans, the, the pagans, are, are viewing this the wrong way. They don't quite understand what they've been doing. Um, but if they're sensing that something really bad is coming through, um, what actually is happening? And you know, correct me if you've got a, a if I'm wrong here, uh, that something in on the dark side, the the infernal council, if you will, has decided that it's time to make their move, and that we are perhaps moving towards a final confrontation. I believe that to be true, and, uh, and the evidence there for me as somebody who's kind of a watchman and just you know all the investigative and the spiritual aspect is. Uh, the, the, everything has changed uh, so radically in the last few years in relation to this. And we now, besides the fact that we in America have our first post-Christian generation, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's what Jesus said, the house is swept clean, mm. uh, but something's going to come in and fill it, and it's not going to be from God. And I think we're seeing our entire society being uh, poured into by the other side because— 
you know, as we know, they have an agenda. And the agenda is, to put it very succinctly, the Luciferian agenda, whoever you want to call it, is a perfect utopian world without God, without Jesus Christ, without Judeo-Christian anything. We know it's going to fail, but that's what they think they're working towards. And um, it's important for them to open up all these uh, doors into darkness to empower themselves to do it. Hmm. The thing that's always puzzled me about uh, pagans and Wiccans who are performing these rituals, uh, you know, even the the so-called, you know, uh, wickedest man in in the world, Aleister Crowley, um, the, the revelations that they were given for performing these rituals were coming from these entities that they're supposedly trying to control. So why do they believe these things were actually giving them the instructions on how to bind them? <laughs> um, it's, it, that, that has never made any sense to me. It's like why a Wiccan would think that a spirit would say, okay, here's what you say, here's what you do, and if you do this, I promise I'll do exactly what you tell me to do. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the delusion because, right. uh, you know, people talk about sold my soul to the devil. No, he's already got them. And right. They're just being used to empower the other side. That's all. But the delusion is, is that you actually get something out of it. It's a temporary deal. People like Jay-Z and uh, Beyonce, I have no question that they've touched on the whole whatever you want to call it, Illuminati or whatever else. But they are simply... Forgive the terminology, but they're just gum under the shoe of the people that really have the power and the money that have an agenda to Luciferianize the whole world into a world that does not believe in God, but instead worships their God of light. Hmm. Well, uh, Greg, uh, what this conversation is, is obviously uh, dealing with some dark subjects. Um, as Christians, how do we look at this? What, what do we take away from this? Where, where do we find hope in all of this, and, and how do we approach this while we while we still draw breath? What is our mission, I guess, while uh, we still have time? And and how well, do we how do we at the end of the day how do we take any comfort out of what we see happening around us? Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, Jesus said to work while it is yet day, because the night is coming when no man can work. So we know that we have to be diligent. We have to put our hand to the plow and not look back. Uh, we need to, and I know for all, those of us are parents or grandchildren, you know, we're, this is a scary subject. But we don't want, like Nazi Germany, for people to be caught unaware, for our families to be caught unaware. We have to train them in the true things of God, raise them up in the true things of God, in the scriptures, uh, in the word of God, and, and raise them up to be strong no matter what comes, because we have the comfort of scripture. First of all, what we used to call back in the day, we have the great hope of the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, and for those of us who realize we are simply, according to scriptures, just pilgrims and strangers in this in this life, uh, that our home is not here, then we look for that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to redeem us out of this darkness. Peter said, save yourself from this untoward generation. I think it's a very uh, prescient uh a statement that he made, but it also means while we protect ourselves from the evil that's out there in our families by giving them the right things, we have to be out. We have to take the battle to the gates of hell. I believe that with all my heart. It's time for churches to wake up, stop playing games, stop entertaining people. I'm not criticizing the church. I am the church as you are, as we all are, mm-hmm. but we need to really, really, you know, step up and say, you know what, we've got to go to the the gates of hell to redeem people out of the darkness while we still have time. And we cannot live in fear of any of this. And the Bible says, perfect love casts out all fear. So the more we immerse ourselves in the love of God and the presence of Jesus and his word every day, the Bible says, uh, you know, wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous will be bold as a lion. And that's my prayer for this generation. Mm. Where do people follow your fire ministries, your your ministry, and how do they get in touch with you if they want to invite you to speak before their group or at, at their event? Uh, well, at GregoryReed.com, that's R-E-I-D.com. Uh, that's where uh, the contacts can be made. Uh they can call 915-595-3569, and we'll return a call. Um, and just, uh, I'm on Facebook, 
I'm also on uh, Instagram. I'm all updated on that stuff. So uh, <laughs> just look for Gregory Reed. You'll find me out there somewhere. All right. And I'll put links in the show notes at vftb.net for uh, uh, your website and uh, contact information. Uh, Greg, appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Uh, found your presentation in Lubbock, which will be available, I'm told, through the DVD set that is being produced as we record this. Uh, I highly encourage listeners to get that DVD set, if only for Dr. Reed's presentation, because it is eye-opening. If you're not familiar with this type of work, if you've not followed the work of uh, Greg Reed or Russ Dizdar or others in deliverance ministry, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where theology meets reality and gets put into practice. So, Greg, thank you very much for your time tonight, and really appreciate your work. Thank you, sir. Dr. Gregory Reed, his website again is GregoryReed, R-E-I-D dot com. You'll find a link in the show notes at vftb.net. And wherever else you might be listening to this podcast tonight. Coming up, we'll tell you how to get two conferences for the price of one. Two for the price of one. And we'll wrap up with a look at our schedule upcoming as a view from the bunker continues after this. When did the government alien programs originate and why? Who were the Collins elite and were they exposing the dangers of such programs? What exactly did these black projects involve? Learn the astonishing answers to those questions and so much more. Skywatch TV is proud to announce the Higher Entities Ultra Collection. This special offer includes the new Fall Brothers feature film, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes, which is a live-action documentary including up-close and personal discussions with former FBI agents, Department of Defense consultants, best-selling authors, and seasoned research professionals that deliver intimate testimonies of disclosure, which put you face-to-face on location and in the conversation, featuring Justin Fall, Dr. Thomas Horn, Ray Boucher, Derek Gilbert, Stan Dale, Darren Geisinger, Chad Riley, and Wes Fall. But that's not all. You'll also receive the top-secret five-volume DVD collection, Project Stargate. This unprecedented series of never-before-released confidential interviews features 12 of the world's leading authorities on UFOs, so-called aliens, gods, and the coming day of contact. You'll be amazed as we go behind the scenes to ask experts what they really believe is coming. Watch as men with security clearances like the late Dr. Chuck Missler share for the first time what they know. Then take notes as Dr. Michael Heiser, the late Chris Putnam, Russ Dizdar, Joe Jordan, L.A. Marzuli, Daryl Sims, Gary Stearman, Joyce Ahrens, and others as they weigh in on what will soon cause the world to stand still in awe. Project Stargate holds a retail value all by itself of $150, included now for a limited time in the Higher Entities Ultra Collection. Sold separately, this Ultra Collection holds a retail value of $175, yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So take advantage of this incredible offer now and receive all five Project Stargate DVDs along with the new Higher Entities documentary for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. Now at the Skywatch TV store, order the Higher Entities Ultra Collection online or call 1-844-750-4985. Talking the Walk every Sunday night. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Next Sunday night, I'll tell you how to arm your children, your grandchildren, nieces, nephews, young people in general. How to arm them against the message of the secular world. Doug Overmeyer of Sears Sea Ministries, our guest next Sunday on A View from the Bunker. That's September 8th, 2019. Mark your calendar and subscribe. Download the podcast as soon as it's released. Links at vftb.net. Well, I didn't think it was going to fade that fast. <laughs> well, that's <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the things we run into when we try to do this uh, semi live. Anyway, uh, this, as you notice, it was a pre recorded version of a view from the bunkers. We're going back to the uh, the former podcast method for delivering these uh, programs because our schedule coming up uh, just gets too busy on Sunday evenings to continue to do these on a live basis every Sunday night. As we were looking into uh, September and October, uh, there's a stretch of about five weeks in a row where I'm going to be away from home on Sunday evenings. So 
Uh, we're going back to the old way of doing it, and um, I will uh, post these in re- to release on Sunday evenings. So at least the time frame of the program is uh, kind of what you've been used to over the past uh, past year or so that we've been doing VFTB Live. Um, two conferences for the price of one. Two for one. Uh, that is the offer that Gen 6 Productions is making for the True Legends Conference coming up in September. It's coming back to Branson. It'll be at the Mansion Theater September 13th through the 15th. Uh, tickets, if they are not already gone, will be completely sold out very, very soon. So your best bet for taking part in the conference, and the theme this year is very important, um, answering the alien question. Now, I say that not just to try to sell tickets or streaming video, but because recent surveys of Americans and, well, people around the world show that there are more more people in this world who believe that we're being visited by extraterrestrials than believe in the God of the Bible. Josh Peck documented this for our book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. It's true. 36% of American adults, people over the age of 18, believe that there's evidence that we've been visited by E.T. According to the Barna Group, only 9% of American adults have a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview defined as uh, a belief in the God of the Bible, uh, basically holding fast to six key tenets of Christian doctrine, like Jesus was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life, Satan is a literal entity and not just a concept, you cannot earn your way into heaven, and and so on. Uh, Should be Christianity 101. Uh, Only 9% of American adults hold that that view, that worldview. Sadly, only 19% of people who identify as evangelical Christians hold that view. So it's not much better inside the church than it is outside the church here in these United States. But I repeat, 36%. 36 percent believe we're being visited by extraterrestrials so uh and when you start digging into the et phenomenon you begin to realize that it is a quest for spiritual truth people who are trying to find the answers to push the government to disclose what it allegedly knows about extraterrestrials um they're really looking for spiritual truth and not for technology that will enable us to cross the distances between the stars when you really start digging into the extra the the UFO community, you'll find that there are there are some researchers out there, and a number of these will be at the True Legends Conference, like Chase Kletsky, Michael Schratt, uh, Richard Dolan, who are honestly looking at the um, the phenomenon and trying to promote the idea of disclosure, trying to get the government to reveal what it uh, what they believe the government knows, uh, who investigate the uh, the cases with open minds, which is why they've been invited to a Christian conference by Steve Quayle, Timothy Alberino, uh, to speak alongside committed Christians like Gary Stearman and L.A. Marzulli. Uh, Pastor Paul Begley will also be there now as part of a panel discussion on Sunday, along with Steve Quayle. Um, But there are many inside the UFO community who don't get it, um, who, who are convinced that uh, the old gods of the ancient world were just misidentified astronauts, the ancient alien theme. And this is one of the things that Josh and I document in our book, which startled us when we started pulling on some threads. And we found that secular researchers, well, one secular, one who's into the occult, document that the entire phenomenon, this, this entire what, 13-season run of Ancient Aliens was inspired by Eric Von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods, which is not a surprise, but that Von Daniken, in turn, was inspired by the horror fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, who, in turn, drew on the occult teachings of Aleister Crowley and H.P. Blavatsky. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Interesting, it's another H.P., isn't it? Uh, For the fiction that he wrote, so even though Lovecraft was an atheist, or claimed to be, he was drawing on occult teachings for the plots in the stories that he wrote, the Cthulhu mythos. So all of this goes back to the work of a horror author inspired by occultists. Their work repackaged as chariots of the gods, gold of the gods, etc. And that has inspired an entire generation to look to the stars and believe that our gods are really extraterrestrials. That's why 
This True Legends conference is important. It's why I would like to see more people get Josh's and my books book in their hands, not because it benefits us, but because we think we're something important in there, that the ancient aliens meme is comes right out of the occult. So if you sign up for, for streaming video, and this is live streaming from the True Legends Conference, September 13th through the 15th, um, Gen 6 will give you access to all of the video recorded at last year's conference, which deals with the uh, transhumanism issue. Transhumanism and the Hybrid Age, which features, well, Sharon giving a dynamite presentation that blew the minds of uh, <laughs> some very important, very intelligent men, like Professor Hugo de Garris, one of the world's leading researchers in artificial intelligence, who will be a speaker at this year's conference, by the way. Um, I was sitting behind him when Sharon gave her talk, and he was saying to the person next to him, which I, if I remember correctly, was Richard Dolan, I didn't know that. So Sharon impressed some very intelligent people last year, and you can see that presentation, all of the presentations from last year's Transhumanism Conference, the True Legends Conference from 2018, at no extra charge. So you get this year's conference in September, you get last year's conference as soon as you sign up at gen6.com, G-E-N-S-I-X.com. Now, if you're going to be at the conference, please come up and say hello. Sharon and I will be there. Um, we're, we're blessed once again to have a table right near the entry to the Mansion Theater in Branson. So we'll be there to say hello, and um, it, it is it is energizing and and truly a blessing to us when when people uh, when, when you do that. So hopefully we can see you there. But if not, uh, do take advantage of this information because this conference, one of a kind, a Christian UFO conference, just like last year's Christian Transhumanism conference. I know that the Christian Transhumanist Association likes to claim that they were the first ones to host a Christian Transhumanist conference. Well, yeah, not sure about that, but certainly the 3,000 people who were at Branson last year got their money's worth in terms of the information uh, that was delivered. Because transhumanism is another, just another 21st century religion with a science fiction veneer, like the modern UFO phenomenon. Now, the weekend after that, um, I will be heading out to California. That's the look he is coming with the Clouds Prophecy Conference, September 20th through 22nd. This is in Fresno. Well, actually, just east of Fresno, about 15 minutes east of Fresno, the town of Sanger, California. I'll be speaking along with Paul McGuire and Troy Anderson. They're the co-authors of the best-selling books, The Babylon Code and uh, Trumpocalypse. Pastor Greg Crocker has uh, asked us to come out there and uh, put on his the first ever Bible prophecy conference they've had at this particular church. Um, I'm not sure in recent years, anyway, how often there have been prophecy conferences in California. But uh, this is something we should try to encourage. So um, it's a very reasonable cost. If you sign up, uh, well, let's see, it's $30 for a single ticket. But if you two or more uh, come together, for every two tickets, it's uh, 45 bucks. So essentially, you get the second ticket for half price. So $30 for a single, uh, any two people coming together, 45 bucks for two. And you should uh, make plans to reserve early because s s since this isn't a church, it's going to be rather close quarters, a couple hundred people probably. Um, but we would like to fill the church for this and then uh, hopefully deliver some good information that you all can uh, take with you. Uh, when you go and uh, share with your home congregations. For more information and to sign up for this conference, it's crosspointchurch.net. That's Crosspoint Church in Sanger, California. Crosspoint with an E. Crosspointchurch.net. In October, we got a couple of conferences on the books. The Unsealed Scroll Prophecy Conference. That's the first weekend in October, October 4th through 6th at the Grand Hyatt in San Antonio that's down on the Riverwalk. A great lineup of speakers there. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, L.A. Marzuli, Pastor Carl Gallops, Rassianic Rabbi Zev Porat, and more. Music by John Schlitt. Sharon and me uh, there as, as part of that deal. Uh, we will be speaking as well at uh, a special luncheon. Lunch with the speakers. Uh, Sharon and I headlining that on Sunday. They've got a lunch with uh, Pastor Billy Crone, a lunch with L.A. Marzuli, and then on Sunday it's uh, Sharon and me. The first time we will speak together in public. So 
Hope you can be there because we're kind of curious to find out what we're going to say. Um, check this out. It's such a, This is an incredible lineup and a beautiful location. If you can be there, great. Uh, otherwise, streaming video is available. And when you check out, use the promo code GILBERT20, GILBERT20 to save 20% at unsealedscroll.org. Here the Watchman comes to California the following weekend, October 11th through 13th. Sharon and I will be at the uh, Hilton Irvine with the Watchman. Uh, that's literally across the street from the uh, John Wayne Airport. Erle Marzuli, Russ Dizdar, Pastor Carl Gallops, Pastor Paul Begley, Josh Peck, our colleague from Skywatch TV, Gans Shimura, Stephen Bankars, uh, Troy Anderson, Paul McGuire, Mark Sutherland from the UK will be there as well. Uh, don't miss this one. Uh, boy, uh, another conference where promo code Gilbert20 can save you money. Gilbert20 when you check out at hearthewatchmen.com saves $20 on the tickets, 20% off the streaming video. We'll be going back to Israel next October, October 12th through 25th, and we've got an extra extension this time to Sardinia. More details are forthcoming. Keep your eyes at vftb.net. Leave us a review at Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever else you find us, which is, of course, wherever fine podcasts are sold. A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Our opening theme is Iron Bacon by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com. Our announcer is DC Good. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. <laughs> <laughs>